Good morning, church. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Thank the Lord for this wonderful Lord's Day that we can come together again. You know, he didn't come last week. But he might come today. He might come later this week. But he said for us to be ready because we know not the day nor the hour. He's coming. And I just thank God that he allowed us to come here together. And I'm looking forward to a good service this morning. We had a good Sunday school lesson. If you didn't show up for that, you missed out. I'd like to encourage you to come and be with us next Sunday at 10 a.m. Now, let me take your praise reports and our prayer requests at this time. And I'm going to start on my extreme right. Anybody? Prayer request or praise report? Anybody? Ms. Sexton? Yes, sir. We missed you. Amen. Yes, praise the Lord. How about this section here? Anybody? Extreme right? Anybody? My sister? else up on the platform amen yes Pastor. You know, I have a good praise report. You remember I asked you to pray for my brother-in-law, Hubert Oglesby. Now, he was in the hospital in Atlanta, Georgia, last Sunday. And he'd been in there for a couple of days, and being it was a holiday weekend, there was nobody doing anything. So Tuesday, they did different checks, and they found out that he had an ulcer in his stomach, and they were able to do something with that. But he also, they had seen before, a mass and when they checked for it this time it was gone I give God the praise for that our God is still healing people just like Jerry I believe God's going to bring him out and his wife and you know we serve a mighty God and I like the fact that we can call upon him whether we're 35,000 feet 
up in the air in an airplane or whether we're here on the ground. God is everywhere. And I thank God for answering prayers. But just in case somebody thought of something you wanted to say, I'll give you a chance. Okay, would you stand, please? Let's call on our mighty God together. Lord, we come to you in Jesus' name, loving you, praising you, and magnifying your name once again. Thanking you for this Lord's day that you've given us. The freedom that we have to come together in the name of Jesus. We thank you for what you've already done. We thank you for the good lesson that we had, Lord God. And now we're thanking you for the praise and worship service that we're going to have. And Lord, we just praise you for loving us, for caring about us so much that you gave your one and only son to die in our stead, to pay our sin debt in full. And Lord, we just thank you for that. We thank you, Jesus, for coming and going through all that for us and making all this possible that we can come together in your name on this Lord's day. And Lord, you heard every prayer request that was given in. We put them in your hands and we ask in the name of Jesus that you'll answer them, Lord God, in your time. We're looking for positive results. We thank you for the praise report. We thank you for those you've already touched. And we pray that you'll touch these others, Lord God, that you'll raise Jerry and his, his wife up, Lord God, that you'll put them on their feet and that you'll get them through this. And we praise you for it already. We thank you for touching them. And Lord, we pray that you'll continue to bless each and every one that's here and bless those in the back in Children's Church, Lord God. May everything that's said and done here today be according to your will. And bless and anoint our praise and worship team, Lord God, as they come to do what you call them to do. And bless our pastors. He brings the word. And may we receive all that you have for us today. And may we magnify your name, Lord God, from the depth of our hearts. And Lord, we be sure to praise you for everything that's accomplished. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we go into worship, we want to honor our First Lady for her birthday. Let her know how much we love her. And we heard that you were interested in starting a garden. So <laughs> the ladies of the church have got you a couple of raised garden beds. And a few of us have started you out with a few vegetables to uh, be able to bless your family with some vegetables and show you that we love you. And this is from the church to show you that they love you and uh, want you to know that we appreciate everything that you do for us in the women's ministry and the church as a whole. Happy birthday. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you so much. You going to preach with that right there? All right. I don't know about you, but I need a little life today. Amen. Can anybody else um, vouch with me? I need some life. I am the righteousness of God. I stand in covenant with Him. And through this, I have new life, new anointing, and new power. I will not worry, nor have fear. Lord, Your Word and Your Spirit, they comfort me. I am increasing in Your knowledge and in your wisdom. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Through your covenant, I am healthy. I am blessed. There is nothing missing, nothing broken. You have made me a blessing, and everything I touch is blessed. Lord, I thank you that my family walks in obedience to your word and to your will. Take me, Lord. Take Ridgeville Church of God to the highest place of glory. Amen. Will you worship with us today? We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging seas. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out. Shout out your praise. We shout. 
hung up on that cross then he rose up from that grave my god still rolling stones away there's joy in the house of the lord there's joy in the house of the lord today and we won't be quiet we shout out We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted. Redeemed by His grace, let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise.
Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. today, God. We don't want it to be about any one of us, Lord, because you've been so good to us, God. And Lord, we want to move you today. God, we want you to stop all the angels in heaven from singing and saying, shh, my people in Ridgeville, South Carolina are here to move me today. And God, I just want us, I just want us to set our problems aside today, God. Lord, I just ask that you would forgive us, Lord. God, as we repent today and ask you to forgive us, Lord, for making it about any one of us. God, we want to move your heart today. Lord, we want to move you. God, we want you to just hold back the clouds and be able to look in on us and say that we're pleasing to you today, Lord. And God, we just give you the ultimate praise this morning, God. And we thank you, Father God, for who you are to each and every single one of us, Lord. God, we just give you the praise today in Jesus' name.
hours to dwell in your house waste my hours and my days on you on you what a powerful song I don't know about you but there are moments in our life that we just need to empty ourselves out and let the presence of God with a fresh touch come and fill us. All of these things are running circles around my message. So I know what I'll be bringing shortly. It's a confirmation of the Lord. But today we're getting an opportunity to take up an offer. It's a biblical mandate for you and I to give. And when we give, God blesses. And so I don't make big deals out of giving. Because the Bible says a cheerful heart, a cheerful giver. And so we just simply ask you this. I'm going to read a scripture. And this scripture will actually be from what I'm going to preach on tonight. But it's found in 1 Kings chapter 8 in verse 54. And he reads this. And so it was when Solomon had finished praying all this prayer and supplication to the Lord that he rose before the altar of the Lord from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. Then he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice saying, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel. According to all that he promised, there has not failed one word of all his good promises, which he promised through his servant Moses. I don't know about you, but I want you to look at this. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. And may he not leave us nor forsake us. We need God to move on our behalf, but we got to incline our hearts to him. Look, it goes on and it begins to say this. To walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgment which he commanded of our fathers. There's a tradition that has to be carried on. We got to teach holiness again. We got to teach commitment to the house of God again. We got to commit our worship to God. That it's not based on anybody else. Who's here, who's not here but it's based on our relationship with Christ. I want you to hold your tithes and offering, and I want to pray. Father, today, in just a moment, we will get into the word that you've given us for the hour. But there's a sweet spirit here. And there are needs that are represented in this house. Some that we're aware of, some were not. But the promises that you've given are not failed words. May we have the faith to hold on to them. May we have the faith to stand strong in the midst of the challenge of the promise. Would you move in this house and saturate us with your presence? empty us out that you can fill us with something fresh with something new and that we would be obedient to you in your name we pray amen and amen would you come and bless the house of God this morning
promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. chapter 21. I have an unusual message for you today. Genesis chapter 21. I've titled this message, Do You Have Skin in the Game? The Bible goes on, begin reading in verse 21 or verse 1, excuse me, of chapter 21. And it says, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age. And at the set time of which God had spoken to him, and Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him Isaac. 
Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when the, he was eight days old as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born. Somebody say, oh me. And Sarah said, God has made me to laugh. And all who hear will laugh with me. And she also said, who would have said to Abraham and Sarah that they would nurse children? For I have bore him a son in his old age. And so the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day or the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had bore to Abraham, scoffing or mocking. Therefore, she said to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. The son of this bondwoman shall not be heir or heirs to you with my son Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing to Abraham's sight because of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not let it displease in your sight because the lad or because of the bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he is your seed. So Abraham rose up early in the morning and took the bread and a skin of water and put it on the shoulder of her. And he gave it to the boy and they sent him away. And then she departed. Verse 15 says, And the water in the skin was used up. And she placed it under the boy, under one of the shrubs. And then she went and sat down at a distance from him. For she said to herself, let me not see death of the boy. So she sat opposite of him and lifted up her voice. And God heard it. And the angel of the God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you? Fear not. For God has heard the voice of the lad. Arise. Lift up the lad in him in your hand, for I will make him a great nation. A great nation. Father, help me today to convey to the congregation what you have conveyed to me. As the ground has been fertilized through our worship, through our eagerness to hear from you, I pray that the seeds are planted, nourished, brought forth, with positive results such as these plants that are laid here on this platform. Show us life in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our struggles. And may all things done give you glory, honor, and praise. In your name, amen and amen. You may be seated. Let me just say this number one i'm sure many of you have heard the expression skin in the game but it it simply means a commitment or investment toward the goal now we know that there are some goals in our life that will never be achieved because it wasn't in the cards as an old expression is said there are some things that we want for ourselves that are not ordained by God. And we pursue after them hoping to help God out only to find that we're messing things up. But let me back up. <laughs> Maybe that's just me, okay? You got it down, Pat. Uh, but, but here's the thing. If the skin is in the game, skin refers to the investment. It's a metaphor for the situation. What? situation that you have going on right now in your life that you have no skin in the game. 
You've not invested for God to move in the way that he's already promised you. You're sitting there hoping somebody else will pay the price when God has promised it to you. We have too many people in the church world wanting what God has promised but not doing the work. So let me just help you a little bit in the Investopedia, okay? You know, you got Wikipedia. This is for the investors. The skin in the game, it was made popular by Warren Buffett. Now, if you don't know who he is, well, he's, he's got a little bit of money, okay? If you know who he is, tell him I need some of that money. But listen, it was referred to in a situation, and here's what he said. When he made mention of the skin in the game, it's where one takes their own possessions and invested in something that they hope to be fruitful. Now, here's the thing. Every promise that God has given you and God has given me is for us to be fruitful. God has never promised you anything that will destroy you. If there's anything that he may have given for those that want to challenge that, it is to destroy you because the scripture says that when you decrease, he increases. So it's not to kill you. It's not to destroy you. It's actually to send you through a press to get you to the place that he wants you to be. Watch this. God wants to release a fresh anointing in your life. There's no doubt God has never said you got enough. God's never said, uh, has anybody ever went to the refrigerator and looked at the gallon of milk after it was beyond the expiration date? There's a pattern to show you that there's some staleness coming. Now, I don't know how many of you, when the date gets close, you open up the lid and before you pour it over your cereal or before you do whatever it is in your coffee or whatever, what do you do? You smell it. Because that's a sense that God has given us to show us that something isn't right. So how's your smell in the house of God? And here's the thing, the further it goes, something happens. Maybe this is just in my house, but that meal that is a liquid begins to become a solid. And if there's anything that really turns my wife, it's when she has to open up a cup of milk that's been sitting there, clumped up. And when you go to pour it out, it's like milkshake. Or maybe some of the uh, grits. Some of you that like thick grits, that's about it. And it stinks. We originally invested in milk because it's to satisfy the needs that we have. But the longer we go without keeping it fresh, the stellar it gets, the stinker it gets, the clumpier it gets. And so I'm here today to tell you that God wants to give you something fresh. He never gave you something 20 years ago for you to sit on and all of a sudden you're like, oh yeah, I got it back then. God is still God and God wants to give you something fresh. Why? Because this world needs a fresh word from God. And listen, we got the saturated word of God. But we also have the living word of God. And the living word of God should be in us because we got skin in the game when we read the Bible. We got skin in the game when we pray. We got skin in the game when we come to church. But there's too many people that have removed their investment. I understand we got fear of a a, a recession coming and so people are pulling their money, putting it in something a little safer. Why? Because they understand the process. And you and I have been in church long enough that we should understand the process, that there are hurting people trying to find a place to get well and the church should be the best place. 
There are people that want to be delivered from their issues and the church should be the place. There are people that just want to be loved. There are people that just want to see what God's all about. And they're looking at you and I and determining whether or not it's worth it. And so what skin do we have? You see, you've come too late to tell me that the investments that I do for the kingdom of God are worthless. Because I've seen the products of the investment. Look around you. People have invested in this house. Many of you, hopefully all of you, have invested in this house. Why? Because you believe in what God has promised. You believe that these things. But I want you to see some things. I'm going to move real quick uh, because I, I really want to get to this. In verse 1 uh, of Genesis 21, God is talking to Sarah. And listen what he says. And the Lord visited Sarah. Somebody needs a visit from God. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I just need God to come talk to me. And listen what he says. And the Lord visited and said, the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. Now, I'm here today to tell somebody that the promises that God has given you, if he done it for Sarah, he'll do it for you. Why? Because we know in Scripture, you can look at Acts and you can look at Romans, where it says that God is no respecter of person. If you go to Romans 2 and 11, it actually says, depending on the translation, for God is not a partiality God. God is not blessing those because they give more and you don't. God is blessing those that has a heart for the kingdom. That is not grudging. Oh, I got to worship. I got to go to church today. If that's your attitude, you need a visit from God. Because if you really have skin in the game, it's not going to matter what's going on. It's going to matter about what I can do for God, how I can get into the presence of God. Why? Because God's got a lot for us. Look at verse 2 real quick. It reads this, For Sarah conceived and she bore a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. God will never bring a promise to pass quicker or later than what he said. I don't care how much spirituality you may have. When God says this is when it's going to happen, this is when it's going to happen. And we got to quit losing faith when it hasn't reached the desired time that God said. Watch, what are we talking about? We're, we're talking about getting into this thing because, listen, Sarah had to wait 25 years for the promise. Is there anybody in here under the age of 25? Lift your hands. One day, uh, we got a, we got a, a half the crowd. Probably. Imagine waiting 25 years for a promise. Now, I, I'd like to say that God promised me a wife, and I had to wait almost 28 years, but he did say that. Man should not be alone. So I'm going to count that as a promise. <laughs> but in Scripture, Sarah wasn't the only one that waited. Did you know that Joseph, or, or David, first of all, David waited 15 years to get his kingship. 15 years. My son is 13. So two more years beyond him. That's a long time. To know that you were anointed to be king and have to go and know that this is where I'm supposed to be, but God's got other things to get me there. Why? Because you got to have skin in the game. See, he wasn't the only one. Joseph waited 13 years for the dream to come true. Jacob waited seven years for his wife. Now, if anybody had skin in the game... It was Jacob. He had to work for his wife. Some of us ain't even appreciative of ours. Oh, sorry. You step on your toes today. Imagine having to work for your wife. 
You selected her. This is who I want. And I'm going to work and show you my dedication that this is what I want. Only to find out that the father-in-law done jacked you up. Pull up the veil. I can only imagine he pulls up the veil. I know he done seen her, but I mean, dear Jesus, you're looking, expecting something beautiful. And here comes the daughter that you never wanted. Ah! (laughs) Wasn't expecting that. And there were moments in our life that you and I are coming and we're working hard, working hard, and we think we got the promise right here. It's ready to go. And we lift up the veil only to find out it's not the promise. Why? Because sometimes God can't give it to you all at once. You got to come and work. And when you see, oh, no, this isn't what I wanted. This is only to maintain your focus because too often we lose it. See, throughout these years of waiting, as I even writing this message, I, I, I've asked God many times, God, why do I have to wait so long? You've heard me speak about the promise of running 200. I can remember the day as I stood into the pulpit of the first church that we were at. In 2012, it was a pastor appreciation day. We were running about 166, and and, and I made this bold declaration that I still feel in my spirit of what God said. And the moment that I made that declaration... Momentum was going our way. You're only talking about 34 more people, and it would have been achieved. But the opposite happened. It began to go down, down, down. Because you see, some people like the glitz and glamour, but don't want to have skin in the game. You and I have to have skin in the game. Why? Because at the end of the day, that's where we care about our investments. I don't know about you, but some of you may have 401k sitting out there right now, and the tank is happening. And you're looking at it and saying, oh, my, can somebody turn this thing around? And if you pull it out now, you've lost a lot. And see, here's the thing. If we pull out now in the midst of trials and circumstances and just pull up the towel and say, I quit, we take a huge loss. The investments, many of them will tell you that when you make an investment, it's a long-term investment. You're going to realize the market's going to go up and it's going to come down. But at the end of the day, if you'll stay true to it, it will prove beneficial. If you stay true to God, it will be beneficial. There may be ups and downs, highs and lows. It may feel like that you're about to be bankrupt, but I'm here today to tell you that God wants to bless you, but you got to have skin in the game. See, people jump church because there's no skin in the game. People criticize leaders because there's no skin in the game. People aren't as committed anymore because there's no skin in the game. A few years ago, Perry Stone, if you don't know who he is, he's a minister, uh, is a prophetic minister. But listen, he said this at the South Carolina Church of God camp meeting. The reason churches don't grow is because pastors don't stay there long enough to birth spiritual children. This church is not a stepping stone. This church is is a vital ground for the kingdom of God. But I would go a step further than what Perry Stone said and say the reason the church isn't growing, I know I've said God does the increase, but you and I got to have skin in the game. We got to want the church to grow. We got to quit this mentality of my 40 and no more. We got to want people to come. I want the broken to come. I I, I want those that are desperate for God to come. I want those that are hung out on drugs to come. Why? Because we're supposed to be a house that helps. And so if we took what Perry Stone said a step further, the reason the church doesn't grow is because the church, the church doesn't stay long enough to birth spiritual children. 
people jump left and right. But so let me ask you, if you've been in the church long enough, and I'm talking about not here, but the church in general, how many children have you birthed? Have you birthed a great nation like was promised to Abraham because you're constantly winning people to the Lord and, and you just want to expand the kingdom of God? I, I had a young lady reach out to my wife and I and, and, and just say, help me pray for salvation. It was over a, a Facebook inbox of all things. And we walked her through the plan of salvation and added another to the kingdom of God. See, you don't have to be in church to win somebody. You don't have to be, oh, I got to be in the presence. I got to spit on their face and I got to pray real loud. That's, that's not scripture. I believe that God really wants to move in the house. I believe that God wants to do some things. But listen, some of God's promises are conditional. Look in scripture. Some of those were conditional on the people. I'll prove it to you. The one that we always love to quote, if my people who are called will turn, that's conditional, then I will. So it's a, a, a conditional promise. And there are promises that God has given you and I that are conditional and it will never be fulfilled if we never do the condition. But there are some promises that are unconditional. There are some promises that God will fulfill no matter what because of who he is. And, and that is all we have to do. God promised us salvation. God promised these things would happen if we would serve him. And that is, yes, conditional. But the promise of God is unconditional. It's for everybody. And you got to understand that what God wants to do in your life, look at this again in verse 2 of Sarah can see God's timetable is always for everything. God does not throw out something that is, has no time stamped on it. You may not know it, but God does. And his ways are far from finding out. Look at verse 3 real quick. Abraham finally declares to his son the, the promise of God. Can you imagine having a promise at 75 years old and all of a sudden you're going, you're going, you're going, and then, oh no, this is not going to happen. All of a sudden you find out that your wife is pregnant. I've never been 99 years old. But I can tell you this, this is a personal opinion, don't, 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 don't hate on this. But raising children, the older you get, is difficult. I can't imagine, let, let's, uh, brother smoke and sister smoke, here we go. <laughs> All of a sudden, God comes in and says, Bobby smoke. You're going to have a child. And Sister Audrey's there and she gets a word from an angel that all her barrenness is about to open up. You enjoy the grandchildren and the great grand, but imagine raising children at 100 years old. I know the biblical stuff is a little different from today, but I'm just telling you, at some point, God says, I don't care about your age, I care about your heart. I'm going to give you some promises that you think are too good at my age. I can't fulfill it. If God gave you the promise, he knows that you can we need to quit listening to the wrong voices, put the skin in the game, and if God says this is going to happen, it's going to happen. We just march with faith. Look with me again in verse 4. Abraham circumcised his son at eight years old. Now, that was a tradition of the day. Eight years old. I want you to understand the... Biblical number for eight is new beginning. It's a new beginning. 
And I'm not going to sit here and tell you, oh, prophetically, you know, uh, August, is that's going to be our new beginning. No, I'm not in that. But I am here to tell you to tell you this. At eight, it represents the new beginning, and it's also the number of hope. And, and for those that don't understand what circumcision is, I, I'm not getting all deep into it. I'm just going to tell you, it hurts. And if you and I expect to receive promises of God, it's going to hurt at times. It's not going to be an easy road because God is not all about making it easy, but making it possible. The enemy has convinced us that if we serve God, all the difficulty is gone. I'm here today to tell you that's a lie. Because if you're serving God and you're married, you got difficulties. I ain't saying which one, but you got difficulties. And if you want to add into the drama of the difficulties, Start bringing some children. And if you think, I got that figured out, let me just help somebody. Move your in-laws in with you. Oh, I done struck a nerve right there. You're going to have issues. And Abraham is sitting here with his, his son, his true son. Because you have to understand, Sarah forced the promise. And she says, Abraham, she probably said, Abe, come here, honey. We've been waiting a long time for this promise. I tell you what we're going to do. See that bond woman over there? I want you to go be intimate with her and produce a son. Now, we know through Scripture that Ishmael was born, and Ishmael begins a separate nation, and that nation we can look at follows into the Islam nation. But here's what I want to tell you. That the moment you force the promise of God is the moment that you will always face the consequences of your actions. I have never made a forced promise of God come to pass and never paid a price for it. The skin in the game, let me move real quick. Abraham, five, in verse 5, Abraham was 100 years old when he had Isaac. Abraham had Ishmael at 86 years old. God renewed his promise to Abraham at 99 and comes and says, this time next year, you're going to be a daddy. That's a lot of preparation. The first time that Sarah heard it, she laughed. Because how am I in my old age going to birth a son? But the promise then still stood. And watch this. Let me go to verse 6. Verse 6 says, And Sarah laughed so all could hear it. I don't know what kind of laugh it was. I don't know if it was a Santa Claus laugh. I don't know if it's my wife's side of the family's laugh. If you ain't heard it, stay around long enough. I don't know what kind of laugh it was. But here's the thing I want to bring out. Sarah rejoiced, not inside, but outside. There are promises that God brings to pass in your life that you can't keep it to yourself. Because somebody is hinging on knowing that the faithfulness of God moved in somebody else's life. And when they move in somebody else's life, it's enough for me to believe that he'll do it for me. Let me move real quick because I want to get to the good part. Verse 8, Isaac was growing and he was weaned. Now this normally happens around age 2 to 3. There are some scholars that believe that they were weaned in the term weaned at 12 years old. Others say 5, but the general consensus is about 3 years old. So Abraham throws a party. 
Now, Abraham did not throw a party because Isaac was weaned from his mama. Abraham threw the party because once they're weaned, it's a celebration of life. Now they're moving to the stage of life where they can live on their own. And we got too many Christians that would rather be weaned than grow up. They love the milk, but don't want the meat. It looks good, but they don't want the advancement. And if we're ever going to grow in grace of God, you and I have to grow up. I don't don't mean to be rude. But we got to grow up. We have churches that are splitting over silly issues. Listen, I really don't care what color carpet we put down. The council joked the other day, listen, I'm saying this a joke because I don't want none of y'all getting upset about putting a yellow roof on the church. Would you leave the church because the roof is yellow? It's petty stuff that the enemy uses to divide the church. And then we wonder why the promises of God aren't coming to pass. It's not coming to pass because we got pettiness in the house of God. It's time the adults become the adults and the children learn from the adults and everybody grow up and get some meat out of the word of God. I'm not going to finish, so let me just put it this way. The next verse, verse 9, 9 and 10, and then I'm going to close. Here's what happens. It's party time, having a good time, and all of a sudden, Sarah looks and sees Ishmael mocking or making fun of Isaac, and the party was over. You don't believe me? Go to verse 10. Therefore, she said to Abraham, cast this bondwoman out and her son. For both of them shall not be heirs to the throne. Meaning Abraham, because prior to Isaac being born, Ishmael would have received the inheritance of Abraham. Here's what I want to say. We got to quit spoiling somebody's party. When somebody gets saved, when somebody gets delivered, when somebody gets a blessing, we don't need to judge that. Here's, listen, you got to understand, I'm about to mess you up. That son that she was saying needs to go was Abraham's. Sarah created, helped create, if I can phrase it that way, helped create Ishmael. Because she forced the promise. Get that woman out of here. That woman is who you gave to bed with your husband. And now all of a sudden, because a 13-year-old, that was the gap, 13 and 3, he's making a little bit of fun. It bothers you. You want nothing to do with what you created. And so, before I get too far in it, Come to the piano. You can't discard that quick what you created and forced for God. Because here's what we know. We read it in the scripture. You can go back and read it. Abraham is having an issue with it. Abraham's having an issue with trying to tell Hagar and Ishmael, y'all got to leave that's, that's part of me. God, I know that we forced it. I know it never should have happened. But I take ownership of that. And to cast that away is like a piece of me that leaves. 
And I'm going to wonder for the rest of my life what come of that. But the mercy of God comes down. And God tells Abraham, listen to your wife. Now, church, I'm not here today to be the voice of God and tell you to listen to your wife. But our wives have wisdom. Let me back up. I, I don't want to say nothing. My wife has wisdom. And I have engaged many of you women in this house, and you have wisdom. And there are circumstances that rise up that we begin to question. And, and Hagar begin to question to the point they go and they drink of the water that was in the skin and all of a sudden we have nothing left. She goes, the Bible says, at a bow's distance because she didn't want to watch her son die. In your point of desperation, God's going to visit you. But you got to get to a place that your ears hear the matter. The Bible says that the sheep knoweth the shepherd's voice. And so I got to listen to the voice of God. And so I want you to stand right now. With every head bowed and every eye closed. If there's a promise that God has given you, and it's not come to pass yet, and whether you've tried to force those promises or whether you're anticipating those promises. I want us to do what 1 Kings 8, 54 through 61 said. Where he got up from his knees of prayer. And so I'm going to invite, if you've been given a promise from God. And you just need God to give you that refreshing, retouch, remind me again. Because I don't want to force it. And I'm willing to wait for it to come to pass. I just want you to come down to an altar. And I want us to pray. I'm not going to ask you what those promises are. But I'm going to agree with you that the promise that God has given you will come to pass. Is there zeal? Come on. This is your moment. You know what God's promised you. Put your skin in the game. Put skin in the game. Father, I stand at an altar. Before I pray with these that are here, I stand at this altar because there are promises that you've given me. And I'm willing to admit there are times I've got frustrated with you. There have been times I wanted to force it. But God, I pray today that you would renew my spirit. Help me with a spirit of waiting for the fulfillment. Help me to be able to be patient. And as I asked you, why do I have to wait so long? You replied, because it's a preparation for you and them. And so God, I stand here today and say, continue preparing me. That I never become an obstacle to the promises that you've given me. That I faithfully stand in the receiving line. No matter what it is that you have for me, let me so graciously receive it. And so, Father, as we pray, we just ask you right now, Lord, would you come and move and minister? I know that there are those in the seats that have received the promise. There are also those that have come to an altar. And so, God, today... We speak in agreement with those in their seats and at an altar. Give them the strength to wait. Give them the strength to stand strong. 
And when the temptation presents itself to force the promise, God, I pray right now that you would just allow us to push that out. Let us have the skin in the game where we have prayed and we have sought after you and we have asked you to prepare me. Don't let me be an obstacle. Don't let me be something that stands in the way, but let me be a vessel of honor. Let me guide people to the promised land. Let me guide my family. Let me be at a place that I can hear the voice of God and know it with a surety that no matter what, no matter what, it's coming to pass. It's still going to happen. And so God, I ask you this day, would you remind us, remind us of the promise. Remind us of what you have declared was coming to pass. And in our prayers, may we pray with a surety that we believe it. That we believe it. In the same way that you spoke to Hagar in a wilderness, would you speak to us in our desert places? Would you minister to us? Provide provision. And may we see the promised land. May we see the promised land. So God, would you bless this church and the people of this church as they have invested in this kingdom. I pray, God, that you would reward them. That this house would be a house that receives the presence of God. That walks in a liberty to move in the presence of God. And may you grow us to greater heights that we can be impactful for those that we encounter. No matter where these feet may take us, may we be evangelists for the kingdom of God. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Don't forget we have a church planning meeting at 430. VBS starts.